Welcome to Rhyme and Reason, hosted by Dr. Barry. Today, Barry welcomes musician Wesley Gear. And now, here's Dr. Barry Ryman. Hey, happy hump day. Welcome to episode number 28 of the Rhyme and Reason podcast. Here with you today is Dr. Barry um, with a very, very, very special guest. Uh, somebody that we actually uh, were scheduled to have on uh, maybe like a month, month and a half ago, and uh, he had some late minute scheduling conflicts and travel plans and wound up in the jungle somewhere. And uh, we're really happy that that he agreed to reschedule and come on today. He literally is um, a rock star in recovery, a true rock star. Um, you know, this week's guest is, if you don't know already, Wesley Gear. He has, in, in my opinion, the most impressive thing of his entire resume of stuff is he has been sober in recovery for nearly 15 years, uh, 14 years and 10 months, if we're going to be exact. But we're going to we're going to round that up a little bit and say nearly 15 years outside of his recovery. Wes is best known actually as a musician who's toured with several bands, uh, most notably the band Corn with a K. Uh, his latest band that he has started is called Human, uh, which later in the show we're going to put some links because it's not spelled human. So if you just search H-U-M-A-N, it's not going to come up. Um, he's also the author to Rock to Recovery and the founder of the nonprofit Rock to Recovery. Additionally, Wes is another pioneer of using music as medicine to heal members of our community from substance abuse and mental health. Um, what we know and, and hopefully what we'll talk about today, at least in part, is how addiction has ravished, you know, ravaged the industry and why, what are the specific challenges and obstacles for musicians who essentially have it all to, to seek help. And what a bottom looks like for for a musician who has not drained their bank account. So um, with that being said, Greg, if you could bring on Wesley, that'd be awesome. Hey. Well, I instantly, hi, I instantly felt guilty about missing you when I was in Costa Rica. And I'm sorry. And thank you for having me back. I feel, <laughs> I feel bad about that. I'll have to do some. I'll talk to my therapist later about that one. Yeah, and I, I I spoke to my therapist already about my abandonment issues. So uh, <laughs> it, let me know when you book your appointment, and we'll do you know we'll talk about our findings well, and outcomes. I'll see her later today. I'll bring it up for sure. <laughs> Good. Um, <laughs> listen, man, we're we are at at Ryman Reason. Really excited to have you on. Um, we, we've had on in the past, you know, a number of musicians, and I always love to discuss recovery, especially with people who are in the industry. Um, as you know, uh, I'm with Recovery Unplugged, which is a, a total music immersive treatment program. Um, you know, one of our one of our partners is or was a touring member of the band Aerosmith. And so a lot of what we do centers around music. We have stages built at our facilities, recording studios. And I think one of the coolest things is and you'll be familiar with this, but we're a co-sponsor with that organization called Music Cares, which uh, is part of the Grammy Foundation. If there's any musician out there that's struggling in need of assistance, they don't have insurance, maybe they've depleted their funds, um, they can get sponsored to come to Recovery Unplugged through Music Cares once in their life. And you know, one of the things before we get into your story that I wanted to discuss with you is every year... Um, pre-pandemic at least, uh, Music Cares was putting on a very special gala um, where they awarded one recipient with what was called the Stevie Ray Vaughan Award. Um, and I remember flying out to Seattle, Washington. This is back in 2018. And the winner, um, uh, the person they bestowed the award upon that night was Mike McCready from Pearl Jam. I remember and that. So, yeah, so he put together this, they put together this very intimate show I think there was probably maybe 300 of us total. And it was, you know, Duff from Guns N' Roses, the guy from Cheap Trick, Hart, Kansas, um, uh, Mike Ness from Social Distortion. It was just like a big group of talented musicians. 
Silver guys. But, it, a lot of those but it all centered around people in recovery. Yeah. And one of the things, and I'll never forget this, but one of the things that was discussed um, through Music Cares is that musicians who are touring actually lead a very lonely life. Um, that depression runs rampant in touring musicians. And you would think from an outsider's perspective, you have all the eyes on you, you have the glitch, you have the glamour, you're up on stage, but you're acting, right? You get out on stage and you're acting, you're putting your best face forward. No matter how bad your day was, you know that you have to perform and you go up on stage. Yeah. But then when all those people scurry off and the night is over and you're back on the tour bus, a lot of these musicians are self-medicating, right? To deal with these emotions where they might miss their family, their wife, their daughters, their, their sons, their husbands, whatever it is. Um, so I, I wanted to get your perspective before we even get into your history. If that's anything you as a touring musician related to or, or can relate to or, or what's your experience around that, Wes? Yeah, well, you know, the disease of addiction is multifaceted. And while there's some people who maybe are, <clears throat> you know, grounded and okay otherwise, it's typically underneath the addiction is a lot of co occurring stuff, you know, um, maybe emotional traumas, social anxieties, abandonment issues, you know, loneliness, all these things that appear that have you going back to the drink or drug because you don't like how you feel sober. So that was certainly my case. But yeah, when I was on tour, it was super lonely. And I, I share about it when I do, you know, my little sober pitch for in, in like the 12 step program rooms and stuff is like, you know, you play and you get the adulation. And then um, you kind of have this, it, it's an interesting duality because on one hand, you're happy for people to be like, hey, dude, I loved your show. And but there's also the like, uh, you know, that's hard to take because you have to be like nice to everybody. You know, oh, thank you. Oh, thank you. And that's draining in itself. You're grateful for it. Then all of a sudden, now you're done at, let's say, midnight and you have who knows how long and you're on your own. You know, and when bands get into a functional realm and they're out there on the road, I don't think what people I think what people don't realize is the whole band isn't hanging out like they're just one big happy family. Everybody has their agenda. They're off on their own. And then you're together for years and years on end. So you're kind of maybe sick of your drummer and don't necessarily want to hang out with him all day. And so, yeah, you're in your hotel room by yourself in Des Moines, Iowa, or someplace that you're not maybe too excited about you know, <laughs> from Des Moines or Nebraska <laughs> or whatever. And all there is is a mall. And what do you do all day? You know, and uh, unless you really have a, a really, you know, strong, grounded mindset, like I'm going to hit the gym, I'm going to do that. You know, it, it can be very, a very tough place to reside because, you can fight off temptation or the doldrums or the loneliness of isolation for a while, but there's a lot of time to fight it off. It eventually catches up with you. And so for me, I was super lonely out there on the road. I didn't, I knew it, but I didn't really know it because I wasn't so consciously aware because I was so hungover and stoned and drunk and doing so many drugs. It's, you really get in kind of a, numbed out mental state. Whereas when you get into recovery, you really learn your emotions. You're like, Ooh, I'm feeling this right now. And it's very articulated, you know? So what have you toured in recovery or was most of right. your touring, your work with corn, was that done in active addiction? No. So my first band was head PE. Um, and we toured with Slipknot and Deftones and Incubus and Corn and all these bands. We were, we all came out together. Those were all our peers. And uh, I got that record deal on a lot of drugs, uh, you know, and fine. So you couldn't tell me I had a problem, you know, and I toured just like a madman. I mean, you know, it was, I didn't understand because I would, we showed up on the Corn tour and Jonathan Davis is coming over going, come here, Wes, sit down. We got to talk to you. I heard about your drinking. It's like, what are you talking about? You guys are drinking too. I didn't get it. But so that band, that era ended for me. And then I got sober. And about six years into my recovery, when I thought my music uh, career was over, you can't do music sober. It's not going to be a part of your life anymore. I really was, you know, talking to the universe and doing these awe meditations for manifestation, actually. And I said, I want to get back into the music biz. And I got 
the gig with Corn because I was in recovery, because they were looking for somebody who had experience touring who wasn't loaded. And so, yeah, I got to tour for a number of years with them, totally sober. What was that like? Well, you know, it was one of the interesting things that I first had to encounter was uh, where Head PE was my band. And if I was too drunk, I was like, who cares? You know, we'll get them tomorrow night. I was a hired gun in corn. So I had to perform, you know, <laughs> I got to be amazing. And it was interesting because when I was, in head, people would say, man, don't you get stage fright up there? And I'm like, no, I don't get stage fright. Well, in corn, when I was totally sober and the pressure was exponentially greater to perform at a higher level, the stakes were bigger, the crowds were bigger. I had a lot of anxiety um, touring and taking the stage with those guys. And, and I really had to learn how to lean in and deal with my anxiety prior to the show. But on the other hand, to be present for the show, to not be half drunk when I took the stage um, and really experience, you know, to wake up in Paris or whatever, feeling good the next day, like, you know, and just feel the world and show up for it was just the biggest blessing. I, I was like, uh, you know, the thing is when we come into recovery, I thought so many of us think our life's over, like, oh, yeah. what's over life going to be like? It sucks. And then they tell you, you can have a life beyond your wildest dreams. And I got the corn gig because I was sober. So to be fully present when I would wake up in a foreign city, it was like, this is a gift of my recovery. So it was a very profound experience. I'm really glad you brought that up because there's a common and, and just so you know, the format of the show is we just fucking talk. Okay, so there's no there's no rhyme or reason to rhyme or reason. We just we just there. we just discuss, we talk recovery, we talk whatever comes to our mind, um, uncensored, vulnerable, um, and, and we shoot from the hip. And I'll tell you that I'm glad you brought up what you just brought up because you said something super important. You talked about getting sober and the fear of never having fun again. Um I've been sober now for uh, just about 26 and a half years and I'm 47 years old. So if you do the math, I got clean when I was five. No, I was just too much shy on my 21st birthday. And, and my biggest fear surrendering was the thought that my life would now be over when it comes to fun, that there'd be no fun to have in recovery, that um, I would be this just square person with no personality and no courage to talk to women or, you know, all these things run through your head. And what I found out was there's tons of fun to have in recovery and you actually remember the fun you had, right? Yeah. That, that, that how I looked at fun, you know, air quotes for anybody who's not watching and just listening, but how I looked at fun was based off how shit faced I got and what I couldn't remember. And there was kind of this shift in perception that fun <laughs> was memorable, fun was fun, and fun did not equate to being faced. And so I'm glad you brought that up because I think that there's going to be people who listen to this podcast that are contemplating whether or not they should get clean because their life might be over and, and you know, to, to double double yeah. back on that it's like fuck your life's not over your life is just beginning well yeah but for me it starts before that it's like <laughs> hold on hold on hold on if you're talking about getting sober then you're not having fucking fun man look at man i was 123 pounds i was drunk every night i was doing cocaine meth uh, amphetamine nobody respected anything i said i was constantly embarrassing myself i was not living a healthy life I, I mean, like by the time you're in recovery, so first you have to start at and say, is your life fun now? Because if you're at a rehab, if you're walking into AA, if you're walking into NA, if you're looking for help, it's probably not that fun. You know what I mean? That's where we got to start at. And I just was working with a, a guy too. And, and he, we were talking about this very thing. It's like, dude, you just got out of the hospital for having a seizure from detoxing from alcohol because you're on a 12 day bender and you crashed your car. That's what you're going to get if you drink. So 
to think that it's an option between fun and not fun, that is right there a distortion. The reality is your drinking and using is no longer fun. That's why you're looking for help. You know what I mean? It's, it's mm -hmm. a lot more problems and whatever. And so that's where I think it's in, in very important to reframe. And the next thing you alluded to is like when I was out there drinking and using, yeah, what was fun to me was acting like a maniac, chasing women. And I wanted all this stuff in this pile. When I got sober, I realized that pile really isn't that good. It's shady people, you know, lesser companions, meaning I'm hanging out with the druggies all night. Now I'm over here and I'm hanging with people doing cool stuff out there, living life, hiking, working on our bodies, working on our music, working on our careers, working on our entrepreneurial endeavors, traveling the world. Like this stuff that I get in recovery is so much more fun. It's a total distortion that we really, I think, need to break. Yeah, I, I think it's literally all about perception. Um, I, I look back to, you know, the and I use this word, not loosely, the insanities that were occurring in my life on a daily basis and how easily when I was using, how easily I justified all of those things to be ordinary everyday stuff. Okay. Like there was just, and, and there is no rationalization today for the behaviors I was doing back then where I could easily justify the shit that I did. I just can't. So, um, but when we're stuck in it and we're living in it and as humans, we adapt to, to mostly anything, right? Uh, as if we experience it enough times over and over and over again, it becomes our new normal. So I think that you're right, man. There, there oh. is, is a complete shift in perception from, you know, the person we were to the person we are. And so, all a, right. I heard a great, great quote from somebody. We lower our expectations to meet our use. Like I'll never do that. Okay, I did that. I'll never do that. Okay, I did that. And all of a sudden, we're in a place doing stuff we never thought we would do. Kind yeah, of with, like with people we shouldn't have been with, going places we shouldn't have gone. You know, I, I will never do heroin. Okay, well, I'll never use a needle. I'll just snort it. Yeah. All right, well, I'm using a needle now, but somebody injected it into me. I didn't have to do it myself. Okay, well, I'll never shoot in my neck. All right, well, I might be shooting in my neck now, but... I will never shoot in my groin. Like we, we draw these imaginary lines that every time we cross them, we don't really cross them. We erase them and we draw another one. And usually it's because we are surrounded by people who are crossing those lines with us. So, and, and then it becomes justifiable, yeah. right? So um, it is complete insanity. I want to know a little bit. <laughs> it's, I want to know a little bit about your story. Um, you know, what was life like for you before you picked up? How how old were you when you picked up an instrument? Have you always been a musician? Has music always been a part of your life? And then where did you start to veer in the wrong direction and kind of what snapped you out of it in, in a short synopsis? Yeah, well, I came out of my mom's womb and I said, I feel good. <laughs> Definitely not the case. Uh, I had a great family. My mom was a nurse. My dad was a doctor. They divorced at five. That did impact me emotionally. I didn't really unpack that and understand it until years later. Uh, we moved back east. I remember talking about loneliness. You know, I was in different schools and that felt really hard for me to have to try to meet people. Um, while my mom, you know, was just trying to go to nursing school and give us a better life. She did, you know, worked really hard to do so. Um, and so then um, we ended up moving back to California. I was a new kid again. And then uh, eventually I picked up smoking weed when I left. I was at a high school for got my roots in a little bit. And then we moved again. And then that's when I started weed. And it was when I started playing guitar. So it was like me, the guitar and weed four hours at a time. And that's how it was. And then I started drinking because it gave me courage to talk to girls. It helped my insecurity. And uh, I had a lot of fun out there. And right as soon as I started uh and i came from a musical family you know my my uh, family was really active in church and my grandfather was the musical director at the church in in massachusetts so it was much more traditional classically based so i was hearing some really uh you know elegant sounds um but uh yeah so then when i was in uh california i was really i was really struggling uh, to fit in with the kids, I felt like. So I, I connected with the stoners 
and uh, just focused on playing guitar and getting stoned all the time. And I got kicked out of school uh, when I was like 15 or 16 for smoking weed in the bathroom. Did I think about quitting? No, I decided to go move in with my dad. He'd let me grow my hair long. And, you know, it's a progressive thing. But like I was starting to say, is like even from the beginning, man, my friends singled me out like because I would get too drunk, you know, and just act like a maniac. And I really never understood that. And that kind of behavior, like I said, followed me all the way into the touring with corn days, uh, you know, before I was sober. Um, yeah. So I was always chasing the rock and roll dream. I got fired from McDonald's, Carl's Jr.'s, uh, where else? So Domino's Pizza fired me and I got fired from a day job I had when I was going to get my first record deal. I lived in my car. I mean, you know, it was uh, it's it's all it, you know, was all that because of my drinking and using? Maybe not directly, but it was just all part of this chaotic life of I was unmanageable. I was drinking and using and stoned all the time. I barely graduated high school, you know, and I think, as I said earlier, um, well, I got a good desk job for a while wearing a tie and working at an insurance company and kind of regulated myself out a little bit. Just weekend warrior with beer and tequila. I quit smoking weed. I quit smoking cigarettes. So it kind of gave me this false sense of I'm in control. And that's when I was starting the band Head. And then I discovered meth. And then my addiction mm. really took off. At the same time, you know, and, and I what was year was this just for a timeline? 94, 95. I always try to stress to people that, you know, maybe you aren't a musician or whatever, but, you know, we look at the similarities, not the differences. And and um, what was happening for me is right when I started doing meth, my band started doing really well. And by the way, I was kind of like the mastermind of the band and the sound. So and I had a respect from everybody. The clothing companies are giving us gear. The record labels are flying out to see us. So I think it's important to note there's a time when we're drinking and or using that it's working for us, you know, mm -hmm. and at that time you couldn't tell me I had a problem I'm getting a record deal. I've been chasing for 10 years. What are you talking about? Meanwhile, I'm 123 pounds and I haven't slept in a couple of weeks. So um, that's kind of how it went. And we went on, on the road and I toured just like a complete madman for about a decade like that. And then, wow. yeah, should I tell you okay. what happened yet? Then, then yeah, uh, take me to yeah. your bottom. Yeah. So, you know, because of the crazy chaotic nature of our band and, and, you know, other issues I had with, you know, I don't know if, I don't know if I have love, had love addiction, but I was just always searching out for where is she to solve me. And because of some of that kind of behavior, uh, you know, the singer and I got in a fight over a girl destroyed our band. Um, so I left the band and I was trying to keep it in control at the end of that period with head PE, you know, just drink, go to my bunk, don't cause any problems, but it was pretty miserable. But once I left the band and I lost my identity of who I was and that thing I created and just, it was so painful. Um, I went back to uh, meth and then my smart idea was because this is what we do when we're addicted. We think of brilliant things. It's like, wait a second, if I do meth and heroin, that will really balance out mm -hmm. and I'll have a much better result over it. Um, and that's what took me to my bottom. And uh, at the time I had a day job cause I, I called my brother for a day job after I left head, like, yo, I need work cause I didn't want to be on the street and broke. And I certainly wasn't rich after head. So that that's what I was doing. Meth and heroin, go and do a day job like audio gear. This is Wes. Can I help you? It was so fucking miserable, bro. And uh, <laughs> finally, and, you know, you're living a lie like, hey, how are you? I'm great. It's like, dude, I haven't slept in a month. I'm wearing makeup, trying to conceal the dark circles under my eyes. And then finally, I told him, you know, hey, this is what I've been doing, brother. I've been on these drugs. And, and he didn't know about alcoholism or addiction per se. So we made a pact like, hey, man, um, I'll quit on my own. I quit before. I'll do it again. And he's like, yeah, just drink and do the weed and stay off the hard stuff. Sure. OK, sounds good. But what happens is I would, you know, get up at five and go to the gym and abstain for a week or whatever, smoke a little weed. And then on a Tuesday, I'd say, no, oh, go have a beer. I haven't drank in a while. And then I'd be off to the cocaine dealer's house. I'd be like, I don't even like cocaine. I don't understand. So the point was that 
I failed all the tests of quitting on my own. And so he kind of did a mini intervention and it's like, yo, you're fired from my company. You can go get help and maybe I'll have you back or go on your own and do whatever you want to do. But I'm done. You know, you, you haven't changed like you promised you would. And I sat there and thought about it. I probably had a couple of grand in my bank account. And I was like, maybe I should go to Thailand and ride elephants. And that's true. And then it hit me. My moment of clarity was I just started bawling. It's like, dude, you're out of control. You've been trying to control this thing for so long and you can't. It's always turning into a run and another. I didn't mean to do this or that. And uh, so I, I agreed to go to a treatment center. Thank God it was a 12-step place because it got me in the big book of AA where it talked about the allergy. And that explained to me, while though I wasn't an all-day drinker, and never was really, um, when I had that beer, it set off the allergy that made me go, eh, beer's not really cutting it. I'll do a couple shots of Jaeger. Eh, Jaeger's not really getting me there. I'm off at the cocaine dealer's house. It explains so much. Mm how cunning, baffling, and powerful the disease was that was sneaking up on me whenever I took the first drink. And so I heard people share stories similar to mine, and I decided to give the 12 steps a try and see if this transformation would work for me, and it absolutely did. So you were one and done when it came to treatment? I went to one treatment center. I worked a pretty darn good program. I, I, I made it first in my life. I got to the point of sponsoring other people, but I weaned off the program. I thought I'm good now. Like I'm up in orbit. I'll just orbit this sober world and be okay. And um, I kind of talk about it as like, it's kind of like having two voices. When I was out there getting loaded, if I was like, no, nah, I'm not going to drink tonight. The other voice would come in and go, have a beer. And I can't overpower that obsession it just t overpowers me when i was sober that voice would come in sometimes working a good program oh man it'd be nice to get stoned no no you're sober you don't do that and you win but running or moving away from the program not being active in it eventually that voice got louder maybe you could have a beer nah i better not and eventually it got louder and louder until again i had no defense and i went insane again going yeah drinking was never my problem it's like, dude, did you forget everything you had learned? And so I, I tried some controlled drinking and in about six months. That took me right back to where I was. And I called my sponsor and said, I was sitting there with a bunch of meth and heroin and booze. And I knew where that was going to lead. And I called my sponsor and said, I need you to pick me up and take me to a meeting. Otherwise, I'll never get in there. And so one treatment center. But then I just went back into the 12-step fellowship because I knew what to do. And the key was for me, what was I going to do different this time? Okay, don't stop working your program and stay connected to the fellowship. Those are the two key things. And that's that's how, uh, helped me stay sober for almost 15 years. That's amazing, man. So I, I've been in a 12-step fellowship since the day I got clean. And yeah. I hear it said from people, and, and I was a... Uh, I was pretty much a, a one white chip wonder, whatever they call it. Like I, I had tried recovery once when I was 19, went to like an IOP program and used the entire time. But yeah. after I went to inpatient detox and treatment and all that stuff, I've been clean since. And But spending the better part of more than half my life in the program, you hear people talk about that have had some time under their belt, right? That that seed gets planted. And what that seed does is it spreads inside you and that if you pick up again, that seed ruins your high. Is that, was that true for you? Like, was there an immense amount of guilt? Like what was getting high after knowing, right? It's one thing to live your life in active addiction, not knowing there's another way of life or, or maybe having heard of it, but never yeah. having experienced it. But once you've, you know, have been active in the program, you've been sponsoring guys, your life got fucking good. And then little by slowly, like you said, you kind of wean yourself off of the 12 steps. You wean yourself off of sponsoring, calling a sponsor, praying, whatever it was that kept you in recovery for that amount of time that you were in recovery, that when you pick back up again, the high is just different. Um, yeah. Is that, was that true in your case or? Well, you made a good point. I did have, um, I did have kind of like what we're talking about living the sober life. It's really, you get that natural high from the simple things in life. It's not a Lamborghini and a boatload of models. It's like that 
pure connection with people and, and the world around you. So I had that experience. But when I first went back, I told people, I'm going to drink again. You'll watch. I'll control it. And, you know, there's so much stuff in the literature about, you know, alcoholism and whatever that there's so many great little phrases in there. But the one that hit me was control and enjoy my drinking. So I was coming home from work and I would just have two really large, stiff cocktails. So I'm trying to control it. I was miserable. There was no gym in my life. There was no camaraderie. There was nothing. And I also for me, which I think makes it harder for some people when it still works, is it stopped working. I wasn't like having a lighthearted buzz. I was like when my mom would call, I'd be like, oh, I'll call her later. Like I was living this dim, muted life trying to control my drinking and enjoy it. It was not fun. So it stopped working. I had seen the light of what recovery was like. And, uh, you know, it just started progressing again. It's a progressive disease. So like I said, eventually I picked up and I was back to meth and heroin. And at that point, there's no facade that this is good, enjoyable, sustainable, where I want to be. It was just a, it was just a matter of time before you surrendered again. I mean, literally I went over to my, cause I was trying to stay away from drugs and just drink. And I, I caught up with an old buddy who had all the things, right. And it was a Friday and we did like one night of all the things. I was like, well, now we're back here. There's no way out for a guy like me. You know, maybe somebody can go in there and have one hard weekend and go, now I'm just going to drink wine and be cool. That's not me. No, <laughs> I mean, in it's the realm of everything's, you know, okay again, I'm done. And I think I, if I, I think if I stayed there much longer, I was going to die. You know, my body was worn out. And, and the other thing too, I like to stress is I was probably 38 at, at the time. You know, I understand why it's harder for younger people to get sober at 38. I was like, oh, I want to get back to the bars and hit on chicks. I was like, now I'm the creepy drunk older guy. <laughs> I was, I was in the bars like, hey, yeah, what's up, girl? I was just like, this is this is disgusting. <laughs> They're like, excuse me, sir. Do you have the time? <laughs> yeah, and one of the first nights I went out to a bar, I took Molly uh, and started making out with a young girl in front of everybody, and just couldn't help myself. And so everybody's walking in the door, seeing like, and I, and I woke up just like, oh my god, you're like 38. You're because it's gross to see people make out in public. You know what I mean? And yeah. I'm making out with a girl right by the entry door of this popping club. And they're like, there's Wes again. It's just disgusting, bro. It's so <laughs> embarrassing, you know? And so that's me. Like, this is what I'm going to be now. The creepy. Yeah. yeah. The, cre the creepy old dude. All it right. So people, yeah. uh, you're big into advocacy now. And, and I assume this, transition from when you're a fucking hot mess, you know, old creepy dude in bars, shit faced and surrounded by, you know, crystal meth and heroin to advocacy. Right. And, and that's a term I use loosely because it's viewed in many different ways. Um, but at the end of the day, and, and I'm going to make this assumption because I don't know you that well yet, but I, I'm assuming that you spend the better part of each day doing what you can to help somebody else. And that really is the, the key to recovery, right? It's, it's, and people think like, oh, that's so selfless of you to do that. But in all reality, the secret's out, right? That we get more from helping others than we get from helping ourselves. Okay. Yeah. So when did you decide that you were going to take the, uh, uh, the path of making this a, a quote unquote career for yourself when it came to actually helping others and doing this work that you're doing today? Well, first of all, I, like I've said, I'm a 12 stepper and right in the beginning of that literature, when they, it wasn't even all the way the 12 steps and the doctor's opinion, it says like that when these people started to recover, that it was imperative for them to work with others. And so, yes, I knew that's vital for my recovery. I know the problem with most with, the problem with being sober, if I'm just abstinent, is my own head, my own thoughts. Like I'm, too, you know, I'm getting old. I'm nobody loves me. Whatever, all this like stuff that my head tries to spin out. And the best remedy for that, aside from like deeper therapy and working the steps, is working with other people because that fills me up from the inside out. But there's also another thing it says in the big book that says something like, uh, 
you know, we do this through necessity more than virtue. Like you're saying, like, it's great to say like, oh, I help people because I'm such a good person. No, I, I do it out of desperation to feel good, to be mm-hmm. honest. And how Rock to Recovery came to be. And by the way, here's one thing that I think new people just don't get, which is, first of all, we can help somebody when we have one day and just go, hey, I got one day sober too. Man, how are you doing? Like, and just be a friend to each other. That gets me out of myself and is and is vital. But how about this? We come in with all the shame and the guilt and the story and the things I've done, but that is what helps other people recover. When I share what a fuck up I was and you know the horrible things I did and how I operated as an alcoholic, when I share that with somebody else, they're like, oh man, I did that too. I'm not alone. Or dude, you are worse than me. Okay. And now my you know, shame and guilt becomes the light for which I can help guide other people out of darkness. So it instantly transforms all that for me into something good that I can use. And then what I was going to say about rock recovery, how that came to be and how I present in the world to help people is that the corn gig was going away and I was desperate for a career, right? Out of necessity rather than virtue And I was starting to fall into self-pity like, oh, great. I was with a giant rock band and now I barely graduated high school. I have no degree, no amount of work. What the frick do I do? So I really went back to my program, which is about, you know, the 11th step is about, you know, staying connected with God, improving that conscious contact. I was really in the meditation. It's like, all right, God, I know you didn't put me here to suffer. God, universe, whatever you want to call it. If I'm supposed to be sober, clearly, and I've been drawn from my soul to be a musician, how can I use what I am, sober musician, to help people and make a living? Now, Wes Gear never thought about helping people ever when he was out there getting loaded. That was taught to me in recover, in recovery. And I think when I invited the universe in and said, what do you want me to do to help people and make a living, is when I felt like the universe really started to co-conspire with me to create something great. And then I got this idea. You're going to go and bring music into treatment. You were in treatment. You drew pictures. You did yoga. But there was no music. But I remembered how it was like when I pulled out my guitar with 22 raw dudes angry and scared and how just one chord transformed the whole room. It's like, I'm going to figure out how to create a a program that can bring the magic of music into treatment. That's That's how it all started. I, I, I... If there's a word stronger than love, I love that times, times, whatever, right? Like that's a, and and you bring up a really good point. Like music is medicine. I think I'm my shirt. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. Right there. Music is our medicine, right? Like that, that first of all, music affects the same areas of the brain that drugs and alcohol do. Okay, it it releases the same endorphins, the neurotransmitters. It hits the same areas of the brain that substances do. Music is a mood changer and music is universal. Right. And I have yet to encounter a person that doesn't at least like music. Okay, maybe there are certain genres they don't like, but and it's a mood changer. Right. And what we find too, Wes, is the connection that is made through something in psychology, we call it an echoic memory. Okay. And you familiar with that term at all? No, but I think I know what you're going to say. All right. The, the, the echoic memory is, um, uh, it can happen not only through sound with music, it can happen through smell. You walk into a place, you smell something, you're like, Oh my God, that reminds me of my grandma's house. You know, like, uh, it's, we have such a powerful brain, but with music, it's even more intense, right? So I bring up the example, if you've ever been driving in the car before and a song comes on and right away you're like, oh, I don't like that song and you change the station, right? What was it, if we dig a little deeper, what was it about that song that you actually didn't like? Was it the lyrics? Was it the the, the, the tune? Was it the beat? More than likely that song brought up a memory deep inside your brain and brought you back to a place where you experienced heartache. Maybe you were bullied. Maybe it was the loss of a relationship. Maybe one of your parents passed away. Uh, Maybe for me, it's a, you know, I equate this Chicago song 
to sitting when I was freaking eight years old in the dentist's office waiting to get like eight cavities filled because I just got my braces off and I don't know what the fuck happened, but I had a bunch of cavities and it was just like a traumatic time in my childhood. Right. And then on the flip side, you're in the car and you're, you're riding down the road and the song comes on and you're like, fuck yeah, this is corn. Uh, I love this song. And you turn the radio up and you roll the, well, we don't roll anymore, but you, you roll the window (laughs) down and you start screaming at the top of your lungs, singing along. And it is an instant mood changer. But what is it about that song? And again, more than likely, that song, again, brought you back to a time in your life where you experienced immense joy. You know, maybe it reminded you of the first kiss you ever had in middle school or the first time you fell in love or summer camp or you had the best summer of your life or whatever the case was. So our brain is so powerful and holds so many memories and holds just so much information that it takes the littlest things sometimes to trigger, you know, before we came on air today, we were talking about the band Everclear and the song father of mine. And that brought me back to a time that I liked, right. It instantly, or a song can come on and like, won't you take me to funky town? And it just reminds me of roller skating in seventh grade, you know, doing the couple skate in one direction. So um, yeah. I think, and, and it's my opinion and, and prior to me being with recovery unplugged, I had my own facility and I looked at recovery unplugged, right. And how they use music to, to, uh, as a catalyst to treat addiction and mental health. Right. And I used to think, dude, that's so fucking hokey. Yeah. You're going to go play the guitar, strum the banjo, sing Kumbaya and expect to get better. And what I didn't realize was how unhokey it really is that how many people immensely enjoy standing up, dancing around, doing lyrical analysis. Like there's just so much power to music. And and I know this has been a lifelong passion of yours and the way that you're now weaving it also into recovery. There's just a lot of synergies. So, totally. yeah. Um, yeah. It's, you know, in my opinion, you know, music isn't going to be the thing Mm-mm. that saves somebody from addiction or trauma or whatever it is they're trying to heal from. But we really need a multi-pronged approach. We don't know what's going to get through to people. Um, when I started Rock to Recovery, I didn't have any letters behind my name and I still don't. But here we are 10 years later and you know we do 600 sessions a month with hundreds of treatment programs. And there's a lot of data and stuff I've, I've experienced. And for me, just... The, the beauty of it was I was in a treatment center with 22 guys when you're raw and you're just stuck in whatever you're feeling like he's cool. Screw him. Ah. But an, one simple chord and I could write a little country riff or something like and everybody would start dancing. All of a sudden the cool guys are acting like a cowboy. And I watched how more powerful it was for people who are raw and stuck in those emotional places to transform with the power of music. And then, you know, what we're, uh, um, you know, finding, well, the, one of the first experiences I had when I I was terrified, y'all, I was terrified. I had this idea to bring music into treatment. I brought a bunch of instruments, you know, where, Hey, we're going to do a song today. And I thought maybe people will be like, here's your F and tambourine. Get out of here. You suck. (laughs) One of the first sessions I did when it was a very rough concept, a guy came in late to the session who was a junkie who was dope sick. And he's like, I came to this rehab to, you know, get help. I'm probably going to die as a junkie. And what are you doing here with musical equipment? How's this going to help me? Blah, blah, blah. And I was like, dude, I get it. I was in rehab like you. All I had was a little pink egg shaker. That's the last instrument I have. I go, look, we're writing the song together. Here's the verse and the chorus. And I was showing it to him. And he's like, I got him to buy in. Just, hey, just try this. He heard the lyrics. We are singing about addiction. He's like, okay, I can get in this. Hey, can I give you a couple of lyrics? The point is, when he came in, he said he couldn't sleep. He couldn't eat. He was defecating himself. He wanted to die. By the end of the session, he's like shaking this little shaker going, yeah, dude, you coming next week, man? I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. Let's hold on here and see what just happened. You were physically ill. And now you feel better, physically transformed. Mentally, your measures of wellness are better. You now have hope. You're now looking forward to next week. These are clinical 
markers that we look for. And then I was like, whoa, we're kind of on to something here. That's amazing. I mean, and that, that is what it's all about. And you know, that, that, I don't know, man, I don't even have words. That's like, you know, that's the hit as they would call it. Um, tell me a little bit more about rock to recovery, you know, what it is, um, for anybody who's listening that may not be familiar with it. Yeah. I think a lot of people get confused. They're like, yeah, music and recovery. That sounds good. You know, like peanut butter and chocolate, but you don't know what it is. So Rock to Recovery was designed to be an ancillary service so we can bring, like when they bring in the outside yoga girl, right? We can bring music to wherever. I have a team now of 18 people who deliver this methodology, this thing we do, and we work with you know hundreds of treatment programs, and we go out to different facilities. We're integrated as part of their tre- uh, treatment curriculum. So at 9 o'clock, they're doing yoga, and 10, they meet with their therapist. 11 o'clock is rock to recovery. And uh, what we do is we go in and connect and um, have a deep conversation about what we're going through, what we're feeling. And we use that as, as, you know, what our song is and we write and perform and record a song together all in one session, maybe 60 or 90 minutes. Wow. uh, What, what's cool about it is, you know, What's interesting is so you can imagine in a group room, let's say you have 10 people and they're we're trying to talk about recovery. Somebody's like, yeah, you know, my dad and they're trying to give their in. And the other person's like, yeah, whatever. You know what I mean? You get all these varied response, maybe in a group setting. The rock recovery setting, when the therapist would walk by, you see Janie, who's not talking to anybody up there rapping like she's, you know, Nicki Minaj talking about not shooting dope in her neck. And the therapist's like, how did you get little Janie to talk to anybody? And now she's, you know, so that's what we're doing. That's what we're experiencing. And uh, we have a nonprofit. Uh, that's how I started. Cause I wanted to donate, be able to donate these services to, you know, state funded and nonprofit organizations who can't afford a service like ours. We have a contract with the department of defense that flies us around the world to work with wounded veterans and their caregivers. And, um, you know, it's really interesting because for me, where I thought I would never do music again, music wouldn't be a part of my sober life, is actually recovery that got me with corn. And now music is my life. And instead of like, hey, check out my band, buy a T-shirt, it's more, you know, give me, give me, give me, <laughs> come to my show. It's, it's going in and watching these people come alive. And, you know, when you can go from feeling dark and, dreary and stuck in a rehab too elated and getting your body and move and sing like you're talking about. And, you know, one of the other things that happens, um, you know, chemically in the brain is the release of oxytocin and Mm -hmm. oxytocin is the love molecule. It's released when women give childbirth or breastfeed, or we hug somebody for 20 seconds. It helps us feel bonded and connected and a part of. And so, you know, what I talk about in rock recovery sessions is that, pop culture stole music from from society because music didn't start as Beyonce up on stage. You know, it wasn't a caveman walking through the jungle and a piano fell down. He was like, yo, I'm friggin' Mozart. It was tribal. It was us coming together, singing songs of celebration around a campfire, beating on logs, doing who knows what. And nobody was going, you know, (laughs) hey, Bob, you're a little off key there, dude. Nobody did that. You know what I mean? When you're at church, nobody's like, hey, you in the pew in the back, you're a little flat on that seat. Nobody's doing that. We're singing together because it's good. It brings people together. It's celebratory. It's expressive. And that's what our goal is with Rock to Recovery is to bring music back in and just use it as as it was always intended. That's really that's really cool. Um, Is Rock to Recovery state specific when it comes to treatment centers? Are you just doing work in California or? have you kind of expanded nationwide and you have reps that can kind of go into facilities in other States? Um, so yeah, once we got going, I wanted to be everywhere, you know, and, uh, we are, we have work in, uh, Oregon and we work in Nashville and we work up and down California. You know, California is a massive state, Mm -hmm. but because of the nature of what it takes to find somebody who can be trained in our methodology and have all the things. And then, give them enough work. Cause you know, the people that do rock recovery, this is their career. This is their vocation. Um, 
it's not feasible to put it everywhere. You know, would I love it to be everywhere? Absolutely. But at the time, at this time, like for me, it's less about being greedy and not, you know, like, Hey, I want this everywhere. More like, let's be realistic. Let's do what we do really well in the areas that we can best uh, perform it. But, you know, I have a desire to go into Florida. We have some people who are interested in us. And so just being patient and letting it kind of go in the universe's time, you know? What a great mission. I know a few months ago, you guys had a rock to recovery music festival. Yeah. Uh, what was that like? So being a nonprofit, um, I had the idea to have a fundraiser and, you know, it's not so easy to sell tickets and we booked a venue. I just took a chance and threw a deposit down on the Fonda theater, which holds uh, about 1300 people. And then when I was thinking about like, how do we get people in this room? You know, um, I was I, I had the idea to make it a sober event. That way we could invite treatment centers to come in. And what happened is we kind of like <laughs> Rock Recovery itself stumbled into some magic because treatment centers take their clients on outings, right? If you're in a mm -hmm. residential treatment, you might go pet a horse one day or go on a hike or go surfing. So the idea was like, hey, treatment centers come to our event and we honor sober musicians or rock stars or celebrities uh, we had Mike Ness from Social Distortion and Corey Taylor, who will share a little bit of their story. And uh, we've had Jay Moore, who's a sober comedian, and Keith David last year, who won three Emmys, prolific actor. And we play some music, and it's a completely sober event. So while we're raising money for the organization, the other beautiful part is we have red carpet and everything. People are coming in from a treatment center who maybe were, you know, vomiting blood a week before going my life's over. Oh God, getting sober. And they go into rock to recovery. Like Mike Ness, singer of social distortion, sober. This is a sober event. Hey, that, that model, I've seen her before. You know what I mean? It's a, it's an integration. Cause for me, when I got sober, I would go to backyard parties with eight sober people. Everybody's drinking 900 Red Bulls, all kind of tweaked out. What's up? Are we having fun yet? I think so. yeah. <laughs> and it's like, why is our life going to be, you know, cornered off in this little sober section of the world. And so the rock recovery event is really taking its own life in that it's, it's a way to bring the non sober world together, the sober world, people in treatment and say, recovery is as bright and beautiful as you want it to be. That's, that's so sick. I love that. So yes. it was, it was, just, it turned out to be a success is what you're saying. Yeah. So now we've sold it out five years in a row La and it was scary last year. I'm going to be honest. It's not easy. It's the scariest shit I've ever done. And last year was the hardest one yet coming out of COVID and getting people to come on board. And I was really dark. Uh, let, let me be honest. I was dark and dark and dark. I was having suicidal ideation. Like I can't pull this off. And my brain's like, you need to just, maybe you should blow your brains out, man. And I had to call and get support. That's what happens to me as a sober guy. Sometimes my brain's like, well, drinking and using an, op an option, maybe, maybe you should just blow your brains out. No, I'm, I can't do that. So I had to get support, see my sponsor, hit the meetings, dig in deeper. But then when I showed up to that event and we had a line down the street and around the corner, it's like, we fucking did it again. And that's, and that's recovery for you. You know what I mean? I think if obviously if I was out there getting loaded and I hit a challenge, I would have ran away and got drunk <laughs> and mm -hmm. the event would have come. They would be like, where, where's Wes? And I'd show up halfway like I'm here. What? What? Right. What's the problem? <laughs> That's freaking awesome. All right. I want to get to a couple other things because we're coming up on the hour. Um, yeah. You wrote a book. Shameless self-promotion. So as I've shared with you, uh, you know, we are having this, this result of going into treatment centers in some back room and watching people just, you know, just huge transformation. So we wanted to capture that. It's called music as a catalyst for human transformation, rock to recovery. It's 18 vignettes, short stories of 18 different people that had sex trauma or wounded warriors or addicts or alcoholics, junkies, all sorts of people who had miraculous transformations. And by the way, music in our program was part of an impetus to help them transform. We tie in some of the science of music um, that we've talked about and how it's, you know, it's efficacy in, in, uh, in treatment. And so it's really a book of hope. So if you know anybody 
out there that needs a book of hope or you want a new book to read, it's on Amazon. It's Rock to Recovery. Easy to find. And, uh, yeah, that's that. Sweet. That's awesome. And then last but not least, I want to talk a little bit about – and I'm going to put you on the spot in a second too, but not quite yet. But I want to talk a little bit about your new band um, that's called Human. Hey, spelt it right and everything. Thanks for the plug. Here, <laughs> Yeah, Human, I always bring this. Like we were joking earlier, we spelt it really messed up so you can't find us. But if you put an H – you three on uh, Spotify, Apple Music, you'll find us. Um, you know, again, I was out of corn for a number of years. And I a lot of times I think if I was to die tomorrow, what would I be bummed about? Or what would be different? What would I want to change? It's like, man, I haven't put out music in a long time. And then one of the guys that started working for our company, uh, Matt Bartosh, has this incredible voice. <laughs> like, I actually met him. He was working in a treatment center before he worked for Rock Recovery. We were writing a song and I had a really tough group, not much musical talent in the room. And he's like, I'll sing. And I was like, okay, rehab worker guy, you can sing. And then he goes, Whoa! I was like, what? Blown away. Yeah, fast forward to him working for Rock Recovery. We decided to do music together and it's coming out really good. We're somewhere kind of like a, you know, Muse, Radiohead, Joy Wave, uh, you know, Grandson kind of vibe, little new school, little trippy electronic rock stuff. Um, yeah, but you can find us on all the streaming platforms. That's awesome. And I know this might have been before your time with Corn, but uh, um, a month or so ago, I caught that Netflix documentary called Woodstock 99. Um, and I know Corn was at that festival, which was a complete and utter total fucking shit show, if I'm putting it yeah. nicely. Yeah. Um, you, you have any, any stories about that from dealings with, with your, your band members of what that was like? That, so thank God that was right towards the end of Brian's time, uh, before he left when things were going bad. Uh, it, you know, it's funny because a bunch of people know I do rock recovery and we have our concerts. So they come to me and they're like, I'm going to have a three day festival of recovery. It's like, no, you're not. People don't realize the logistics and how, what you have to do to pull off a festival at that level. And I mean, it's just a uh, thank God that it didn't go much worse. Cause there's really could be a large loss of life and stuff there. And that, that was just hell. I was, I was floored. All right. So this is where I'm putting you on the spot. I, my eyes aren't that great, but I spy a guitar behind you. Oh, that's base. Yeah. What about yeah. it? I don't know. I was I was thinking maybe we can get just uh, we have two minutes left of the podcast. Maybe we can get you to play a couple riffs. Um, I don't know how good it's going to sound if it's not plugged I'm in a, or anything. I'm a guitar player, but this is how's it go? Oh wait, hold on. I was tuned different. Okay, here we go. a human song of course you sing no i do not <laughs> probably as good as me i sound great in the shower and in the car with the windows rolled up yeah i'll be here all night thank you <laughs> Woo! so listen wes this has been this is by been the way that's the song that's on that's this song <laughs> <laughs> that's yes. that one right there yeah, <laughs> you got song. all your props huh what else, what else do you got sitting there anything I else know, I got a lot of props i got a, i got like a piece of chewing gum that was in my pocket for a week nice i'm gonna need you to send me some merch um i'm gonna i'm gonna spread no the human band uh i'll sp Please. i'll spread it down here in the south florida market uh, Please. what do There's we got some, some incense for for you yes you burning is better than incense it's just wood paulo santo Super spiritual. Highly suggest. No, it's not weed. I burn it every day before I meditate. And just the mere, like you're saying, smell. Uh -huh. I burn it every day before I meditate, just the mere smell. I'm just like. You get in your zen. I'm zen as fuck. Dude, you're awesome. I, I want to thank you, man. I, I really do from the bottom of my heart. You, not only for who you've been, what you've done. You're just a legit cool person in recovery that, that, uh, helps others. You make a difference in this world. I know that. Um, I followed you on Facebook for a long time. We finally connected a couple months ago. 
um, on a whim, I reached out to you. I'm like, hey, or no, I think you reached out to me about the music festival. Then I'm like, hey, I got this podcast. And you're like, yeah, I'm kind of working on this music festival thing right now, but get with me after. I'm totally down. Here's my email. And I'm like, this isn't going to go anywhere. And, and then it did because you're a man of your word and you fucking followed through. And I hope you had a good time on the Rhyme and Reason podcast. Great time. Uh, I'm, it's an honor and a privilege, man. I just always go back to there's a time when nobody wanted to talk to me or hear a damn word I had to say. So the fact that you give me the opportunity and we get to share this space, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, tune in to anybody who's listening in the next few weeks. I think we're alternating the schedule a little bit. We were a weekly show. I think we're going to bi-weekly. More to come from that. Wes, thank you again. Greg, roll the credits. Thank you.